it's like the weirdest thing. Most teams rock if they try. Hollister, American Eagle, Abercrombie and Fitch, and all these clothes. Here I'm standing in front of a camera with an Alpine Stars shirt and occasionally a Fox shirt. Yeah. Not that it matters anyway. Now I'm going to do an analysis of WWE's Breakfast Club. The reason I'm doing that is because it's three guys and they all have interesting characters. I have to decode them right now. We're going to start off with the first of three guys. It's going to be Randy Orton. Because Randy Orton, as Spoonie said, is basically the sociopath that... He, why is he face? He acts really heel. I guess he's a sociopath you would like. I mean, the media does try and glamorize being a sociopath and shit like that. It's basically Cody Rhodes if he was face. Except, it's very weird. I, mean, it's, I guess you can say he loses control instrumentally, because sometimes he's the sociopath that seems like he's on control and cold-hearted. But the other times he's really wild-hearted. At the same time, it's control frenzy inside. And the thing is, he can't coexist with other people as well because you notice if you, anybody pisses him off the slightest like the great Kali or even Seamus other faces will get decked too by Randy Orton so he does have that issue and it's not a thing of him being a heel eventually or him eventually turning heel he's just a sociopath who can't coexist with other people he has to because he's not the bad guy but anything that pushes him off he'll just strike and you gotta remember this would be stupid anywhere else but here anywhere else but here this would be stupid but cause everybody likes the bad boy and they should sometimes they like the sociopathic or narcissistic bad boy which I think that's just another level they shouldn't even try shouldn't glamorize broken characters now here's the thing I, I was a big advocate of Randy Orton Look at my video, does Randy Orton suck? Tell me that that doesn't sound like an advocate that knows all these flaws, yet still supports him. And I understand all of Randy Orton's flaws, his botchiness, his shitty-ass gimmick, and the way they overpush him, but at the same time, he does deliver when he has a reason to do something. Like, he really does deliver. I mean, Summer Sl Survivor Series, I mean. And even SummerSlam is food of Christian. There was a lot of shit in 2011 that kept me interested. Maybe not as much in 2010, but there was stuff there in 2010. Uh, 2009, definitely. And before, once in a while. Problem is 2012. I mean that shitty ass feud with Kane. You gotta be kidding me. That's not going to be a feud where he delivers because apparently they gave Kane his mask back to Feud of Foreign, but it was such a dumb feud. There was just no substance to it. I'm always glaring right now. But it's just why. Why do that? I 
Like, why waste everybody's time? If you're gonna do that, just take a day off. Take the year off if there's nothing you have to do. And that's the kind of thing I don't really like about the WWE. That the divas, the divas are a little bit more considerate. And that's a fucking problem, because... When there's nothing for the diva can do, what do they do? They focus on something else in their their career. They start modeling in other places and in other industries. Which, by the way, I think this is a really stupid decision of WWE to do a diva search. We all know that divas get too old for the industry really quickly. So, if they fall back because they're too useless, there's nothing that they can really do. I mean, you're 24 and you're too damn old. Surprised Eve Torres finding work along with Kelly Kelly because Eve is 27, Kelly Kelly's 24. That is considered old. Um, what else? What else? Now we gotta focus on Triple H because Triple H is that guy that basically he's practically done it all. He's practically done it all. He's been here since, what, the new generation? And basically he's been kicking ass, doing all sorts of shit, and... Now, basically, every WrestleMania he tries to end the streak. And in between he gets into a kick-ass feud with somebody else during the summer. So he understands his place. He understands that if there's nothing he can do, he's not going to deliver. And when there's something for him to do, he delivers. He really does, except for Triple H versus Kevin Nash. That match was just a giant commercial for five-hour energy. Because <laughs> they were both comatose for the entire match. I thought it was... Even when they hit each other, the hits just felt more fake than the other hits. Like, the way it was sold, it was... It didn't really feel like they were hitting each other, and they weren't hitting each other, because wrestling is fake. I understand this. However... There, there just wasn't a nice in-ring connection between the two of them which surprises me because they did deliver in matches before but that's the thing with Triple H he knows when he's not wanted problem is the guy has excellent mic skills and he likes to draw an excitement for an eventual match is one of five matches a year where he knows he's going to deliver, and he does deliver. And he does this with a long promo that lasts 30 minutes long. Doesn't make us think. Doesn't make us question. It just makes us think, what the hell. It doesn't enforce us to learn something new, keep us wondering. When he does those promos with Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, that thing's gonna surprise you. It's 30 minutes of great acting and nothing else. That promo with him, Stephanie, Paul Heyman, Brock Lesnar. That was ridiculous. I mean, these are all characters that are bitter and sick of each other. And they honestly wish each other were dead. I bet Triple H wishes his wife and kids were dead every single night. You praise for it. Because these are all bitter, old, washed out characters that have no place anymore. And just the way they speak to each other, the little bitterness, the little heat, it's corny and ridiculous and makes these 40 year olds seem like 60 year olds. And I don't want my 40-year-olds to act like 60-year-olds. I want my 40-year-olds to act like 25-year-olds. That's just the kind of guy I am.
What's more? What's more? Again, John Cena. This is the last guy I'm going to focus on. Problem with John Cena is that he has nothing to do even when he has something to do. For him, having nothing to do would be going for the WWE title and actually winning it. That's basically him showing he has nothing to do. Winning the money in the bank. Filler pay-per-view. He has absolutely nothing to do. That food of Kane, he had nothing to do. John Moore, nice and big show. Every, there, there's no way to throw in a pretense. He had nothing to do. The thing is, that guy's a workhorse. He, he is a very punctual individual. He'll show up even when there's nothing to do. He'll find something to do in between. And when he has something to do, he delivers. He always does. In Cena vs. Rock, a lot of people hated it because it was really botchy, but it was an entertaining match. It shows the little contrast between Cena's wrestling style and Rock's wrestling style. And I like that a little bit. There are moments where you think one person is going to win, but it doesn't happen. It was a good match. What's more, um, Cena versus Lesnar. After Cena versus Lesnar, which was the only month, the month of April, where I was really invested in the company, he had nothing to do again. And now, he's in a main event for SummerSlam with the WWE title against CM Punk and Big Show, and he has nothing to do. Which means he's not going to deliver. For him, having something to do involves him going up against somebody who he hasn't fought 20,000 times before and has to actually prove himself. That's why he worked with Lesnar, because he didn't beat him before, and Lesnar was catching Cena at the wrong time, and as Mew said, this was basically what Cena versus Rock should have been. Because they did in one year what Cena Rock didn't do in one month. On another subject, what I think is going to happen is Punk's going to face Rock at Royal Rumble and lose, and Punk's going to face Cena at WrestleMania and win. I mean, Rock will win against Punk, and then he'll lose to Cena. But I could be wrong, because that's kind of what seems obvious, and as we all know, Cena losing kind of threw me off guard. I didn't expect that. I was expecting Cena to go ahead and win and be the next generation and shit like that. I didn't expect this feud to continue and extend itself. And it really extended itself the right way, because it brought Punk back to being a heel. It made Daniel Bryan a little bit more he made, he seemed more like a contender because the rock actually rock bottomed him after Daniel Bryan said that he could be the one to face the rock at the Royal Rumble so it was a nice extension and plus it did add some spice to that food with Brock Lesnar so Cena does deliver he delivers a lot less than the other two. Well, that's not true. He doesn't deliver less than the other two. But he has a lot less to do even when he has a lot to do. Where with Triple H, he knows when he's not wanted and he'll just do things when there's something to do. And Orton, he has a lot more to do, but... Still, he's in a bad slump every now and then. Alright, I'm basically done here.